On behalf of Digistore, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your schedules to be with us today. My name is Mark Richards and I'm the marketing manager for Digistore. The year um, 2020 marked Digistore's 30th year in business. Um, so um, we're now one year into the acquisition by, of Digistore by Videocraft, which, is, which has been a boon for our customers. Um, you may have noticed that Videocraft is managing the live production here today, so we're um, very grateful to have all of that um, live production happening and recording and switching, etc. cetera. Um, um, with the combined resources of Digistore and Videocraft, we're now offer, able to deliver a broader range of solutions more efficiently and to provide our customers with a high level support. So I just wanted to take one sec to explain how that works in practice. Um, Digistore over a long period of time represents and works very closely with a range of leading vendors that helps us deliver um, integrated solutions. And Avid, who's um, working with us today, is a very good example of this. Partnering with Videograft expands these relationships across many more vendors and um, allows us, uh, allowing the combined companies to assist and skillfully support on a, with a broader range of solutions. Historically, Digistore has had a deep specialization in post-production, collaborative storage, uh, media and asset management and distribution. While there's, been, while there's an overlap between the two businesses, our collaboration with Videocraft has brought to bear their high level of expertise in production, live services, and equipment rental. So now the combined companies offer the whole spectrum of media production and distribution solutions, all the way from capture or creation of the content through to its final delivery to the audience with an unsurpassed level of support. Our partnership means that as a group, Digistore and Videocraft can call upon an unparalleled engineering and services resources and expertise to support our customers right across the country. So it's made a, the com combination of those businesses has made a very significant difference in how we can support um, our customers. I just died. Oh, I came back. Excellent. Reincarnation, it is true. Um, I'd like to mention some of Digistore and Videocraft's team that are here today. Um, I've just put a few names up on the screen. We've all got name tags on, so um, if you recognize some of those names, please, um, you'll know who to ask questions of in the breaks, and in some cases, maybe put a name to the face that you haven't um, actually met in person before. We've got a wealth of experience in the room, so please don't hesitate to say hello and um, engage any of us with your thoughts and challenges. Um, all these people are here to help and to learn from you. Over the last couple of years, the pandemic has accelerated the development and adoption of new technologies and workflows, enabling teams to work remotely and accessing dispersed media files and systems. Remote production and collaboration is now an important and standard part of many production environments and continues to be refined. Digistore works closely with customers to help them develop and implement the optimal cloud, on-prem and hybrid workflows for each environmental project. Avid Technology has developed a number of products for these applications as part of their total integrated solution set. We've invited guests from Avid to explain and demonstrate these in order to help you formulate how these tools, technologies and techniques might fit for you. We're privileged to welcome Craig Dwyer to Australia to present today. Craig's background includes a mix of creative, operational, technical and senior leadership roles in the media and entertainment industry for over 30 years. He works with Avid's product and engineering teams, helping clients and partners accelerate innovation and ease development and integrations. With an emphasis on open platforms, cloud and SaaS innovations and the application of new workflows, Craig and his team work across Avid with clients on emerging use cases and solutions. In addition to Craig, we've presentations from David Woodward and Andrew Chow who offer a deep experience with these tools and workflows locally. Our presenters bring today a wealth of experience to the seminar, not only from a product and technical implementation point of view, but also from a, a real world perspective. 
Let's have a look at the agenda today. Craig will introduce the topic and share insights into the technology, products, and real-world case studies that illustrate how these are implemented. There'll be some time after Craig's presentation for Q&A. Um, so while you're watching his presentation, please keep, keep in mind and think of your questions because you'll have time to ask him afterwards. And then we'll take a short break to grab coffee, tea, and a snack. After the break, Andrew and David will provide presentations covering Edit On Demand and Nexus Edge. There, and then there will be Q&A at the end prior to breaking for refreshments served in the same room here. I hope you'll stay and enjoy food and drink on us and take some time to meet the teams. Of course, we can't answer all the questions or address all the specific workflows and requirements for everyone in this seminar. So I'd encourage you to contact your Digistore account manager or Digistore generally so that we can help you further. Here are our main contact and communication channel details but feel free, free to reply to any of the emails you would have received from me confirming this seminar or inviting you to come along and um, we'll get back to you straight away. Look out for the event follow-up with further information as well if everything goes according to plan, a, recording, a link to the recording. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Craig from Avid. Thank you very much. Well, great. Uh, lovely to see uh, so many here today on a beautiful uh, like London weather day. Um, but uh, thanks for, for coming to see us. And, uh, and Mark, thank you for the introduction and for hosting us. So it's great to be here. So yeah, as Mark said, um, so I've been with Avid now actually a fairly long time. Uh, so in my current role, um, I I'm responsible for strategy for our product portfolio around on mainly the video side, but also some of the collaboration we do with the audio team. Um, I'm also doing business development and partners and alliances, and a lot of the partnerships that I've been working on for the last three or four years are with the cloud providers. So I'll talk about some of the innovation, the work we've been doing there. But I thought, first of all, maybe it would be useful to set a bit of context um, in, in kind of how we see the market globally um, and some of the drivers that we see that we're working to address. Um, I think one of the things that's, that's really interesting is just the sort of dynamics and the scale that we see in the market now, especially around some of the uh, challenges with content production, um, the working from home and the kind of hybrid workflows, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of those drivers. Um, the new business models from a consumer perspective driving subscription and different behaviors around sort of um, content and when it's released, box set releases and all these different sort of um, distribution models. Um, and obviously, I think when you look at some of the direct-to-consumer services, there's a lot of demand around high-quality production as well. So we're sort of seeing that playing out globally in some really interesting ways. So. You know, it, when we look at um, some of the projections for the top tier streaming categories, the growth of these platforms uh, continues um, and, and it really, uh, the dynamics that that creates are really fascinating when you're sort of operating at scale. It's clearly, you know, there's a high demand for, as I mentioned, high quality uh, content, but also, there's a, there's a demand for talent um, and, uh, and resources. And those resources can be physical production facilities, studios, uh, but also post-production. Of course, that's you know, big for us. Um, and, and also kind of the efficiency that needs to come with working and operating at this scale. And we see a lot of our bigger clients really driving uh, a sort of combination of sort of, I, I think actually Amazon Studios call it uh, magic at scale, right? They really want to uh, build these highly uh, integrated global post-production and production pipelines. If we look at, so this is just some data we've got around the UK markets, but the UK market's very interesting because actually there's a lot of inward and co-production activity. So just as an example, Disney have partnered with Pinewood Film Studios, expanded the studios, and bought out all of the studios for 10 years. And they're doing a lot of principal photography. But doing post-production, uh, both uh, editorial, 
um, and visual effects in North America, a combination of obviously Hollywood and, and Canada. But you know, they very much look at this as a, um, you know, building a huge content um, factory almost, where they can automate and manage all of this content but, uh, and have very consistent tools and a creative process that allows them to be able to operate at that scale. So in terms of the, um, you know, one of the challenges we're also seeing is, is, is the sort of the opportunity to be able to work effectively and, and tap into global talent. So this market, actually, we have some extremely talented global filmmakers, uh, post-production companies. And more and more, I think, what we're beginning to see is these larger clients starting to reach into these markets to be able to tap into that talent uh, and work more efficiently. And that's a trend we see continuing. But the other thing that's really interesting is, you know, and this again is a sort of European study, but uh, not specific to media, but just in general, uh, which I thought was interested. But now sort of 16% of, uh, of roles are working solely from home. So they're not hybrid, they're solely working from home. Um, and we continue to see that sort of trend uh, where people want that sort of workforce flexibility. I think in this study they were saying that flexibility and work from home is worth about 7% in salary for people in terms of that kind of like how they do the sums in you know, the value of being able to have that flexibility and freedom. Of course, though, I think if you're watching closely, a lot of big companies are changing that, like Disney, for example, are trying to mandate you know, people back in uh, facilities. And others, I think, are still trying to work through. Many companies, I think, are still trying to work through what's the right mix. But, but that study also said, though, for people who are in hybrid role, roles, and in fact, talking to some of my sort of colleagues and friends here, I think it's not unusual to want to do two days a, work, a, a, a week from home, maybe more. Uh, and in fact, I've got friends who work here, and they're doing sort of one day a week in the office, the rest of it from home. So people are looking for a lot of flexibility, and we're looking to provide the right tools so that clients can have that flexibility in their workflows as well. And I think what we see from an innovation perspective is that we really need to um, provide the tools that our clients can use to attract, connect, and build audiences. And that's really driving a lot of what we're doing. And there are sort of four main areas that we see uh, being critical for us to address. High production content, content um, give the tools the flexibility to connect to talent, increase speed and efficiency in delivery and production, and because of the component about hybrid working, really focus on um, connectivity, whether it's from a user accessing the systems or their media or collaborating and being able to work remotely. And if we think about post-production traditionally, we had sort of different activities happening in different um, either physical facilities or different departments. And that, that sort of, in many cases, has continued uh, for a long time. So we would have different uh, crews working on different projects. Again, principal photography on set. Then we'd come into post-production. Then we'd get into distribution and marketing. But when you think about the pressure that many of our clients face to get content localized, box set released, you know, maybe 20 or 30 versions uh, on a day and date release, they're looking to really bring a lot of this uh, together more efficiently. So actually what we're starting to see is uh, a, a much more connected ecosystem where the workflow, um, there's, there, there can be a lot more simultaneous working and people can work the same way whether they're in a facility or they can or remotely, um, you know, under a so, some sort of secure uh, network environment. Does that make sense? Just sort of setting up the context. Is that is that sort of how you, you guys see the market here? People working hybrid. Is there, you know, those kinds of scenarios are re reality? So that sort of makes sense. Okay. So then I thought what I would do is just talk about some of the case studies that we have where clients are using a combination of these new workflows, methodologies to be able to deliver their uh, solution. So 
Uh, Peter Pock uh, is a film producer, um, and his art house production company called Glass Eye Pictures do independent films. And in fact, recently, um, they were producing filming in New Zealand, but doing post-production in LA. And they used a cloud-based edit-on-demand system um, where they had high res ingest, created a proxy, uploaded that to the cloud, and then all of the post-production and workflow was happening with their editor um, and production team. And then finally, actually shipped the physical media back to LA and did all the grading and mastering. But it meant that instead of having to wait for everyone to return back to base, they could start post-production and actually get feedback from editorial back into production in real time. That's really what they wanted. So overnight, they would look at the dailies, start cutting scenes, provide feedback to the production team. And this was using our on-demand cloud system. Um, it's a very standard configuration, and in fact, we'll, we'll hear a bit more about it today. Um, but, it, but it's really analogous to a rental system. It all just happens to be in the cloud. So they, they rented seats and storage. Uh, they have an upload client, and they're uploading media and working it over a period of, I think this one was about 30 weeks of post-production. So very re relatively simple um, process and methodology. The next one I wanted to give as a quick example is Paramount. Um, and actually, we've been working with Paramount on cloud projects now for about five years. Um, we had, when COVID um, sort of impacted their business, we actually accelerated uh, a number of projects that we had with them. So we were doing a POC actually in Sydney and London for um, Paramount, or at the time, Viacom uh, International. So Viacom International had just joined with C rejoined with CBS, so Viacom CBS, and that's now become Paramount. But um, they asked us basically okay, you know, let's stop the POC. We now need um, a couple of hundred seats of editorial because everyone's going to be working from home. We don't know for how long. So because of some of the integrations we needed to provide for them, we actually built a, cu a custom managed cloud service for them, which we still operate for them today. So actually, Avid is running the Paramount post-production cloud, um, and that there's about 350 editors at any one time around the globe using that service. So that's fully uh, deployed. We're actually using the Microsoft Cloud, so it's in Microsoft Azure, but it's in my tenancy. So Avid runs it, operates it, um, and they just pay per, um, per user, per edit. You know, it's sort of metered how they use that service. The other thing is in this environment, in a managed cloud environment, we, we have a bit more flexibility. So if they have a project or production that needs a certain integration, we can get in and configure the system and add that workflow. So we have a lab with them, and we're, and we're adding workflows as they need. In our on-demand service, it's much more um, sort of constrained, if you like. So we have a you, you, you self-service. You go in, and you log in, and you pick the tools off a list. We can't do as much configuration, and that's where this, this managed cloud uh, you know, is differentiated. But again, they're using this. Um, they're doing things like compliance, promo editing, news um, package editing, Paramount pictures are using it as well. Um, and in fact, in this agreement, they are also able to work with their, some of their external post-production uh, clients, log into our system on their behalf and do post projects. So it's like a supply chain enabler for them as well. So the next one I wanted to just highlight is uh, A&E Networks. Interestingly, A&E are using the same thing as Peter Pock, uh, our on-demand service. Um, and they've been in that system now for a couple of years, done about, um, I think at the height, they had 12 series running in the system. I think there are about nine today. Um, and these are sort of 10 editor type scenarios. So 10 editors working on a TV series for A&E. They're doing all that post-production in our cloud um, and they're using it pretty much for you know, all of their sort of um, post-production um, show creation. And in fact, interestingly, they don't want to 
th they really want the fact that it, they don't have to be in the office to manage it. And I met with one of their executives a year ago in New York, and it's the first time he'd been in the city in four years. And he came into a meeting with us, and he was like, well, I don't usually do this now. <laughs> um, so they just all work remotely. They don't want to work physically back in the facility. Um, that they've just reorganized themselves to work remotely. So, you know, I think, again, various clients are on different stages of the journey about really what that means for them, whether they have real estate or, or don't have real estate, um, and how that works for their particular production style. But, um, again, this, this has been a very successful deployment, and we're partnering with them to increase um, some of the workflows to do... Um, streamlined camera to cloud style workflows because they want more fast turnaround in their post-production pipelines. All right, so those are some of the, the examples that we've got running in Microsoft Azure as part of our managed cloud or, or on-demand services. The other case study I wanted to talk about is actually uh, Amazon Studios. So we've been working with Amazon Studios for now actually about five years. Um, just using Media Composer and Pro Tools, doing standard post-production on-prem. Uh, we did a trial with them in Microsoft Azure, but actually being owned by Amazon's web, you know, AWS and Amazon, they really wanted us to, to bring our capabilities to AWS. So we're in the process of doing that with them. They signed a three-year agreement with us, which we can talk about publicly, um, and we're supporting this vision to build Studio in the Cloud for them. So what that means is we're really bringing the Nexus file system and Media Composer and uh, integrating into an ecosystem of partners that they need to create their post-production uh, pipelines. So Amazon Studios um, have built a pretty significant facility now in, uh, in California, in Culver City. Um, and they are building out stages, production facilities. But the centerpiece of what they're doing is really building um, a globalized production infrastructure that they can deploy on shows you know, everywhere. So you know, down at the bottom right here, you'll see sort of Avid and Media Central um, as part of the editorial piece, but we're really uh, getting integrated into a much larger ecosystem that they need. And post-production, as we know, isn't an island. I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. But they see uh, the need and demand for being able to integrate um, their post-production systems in a very dynamic way. And of course, the business impact of this is that they want to gain the advantage of being able to more directly manage costs against production. So they want to be able to dynamically uh, establish post-production pods for a production, allocate the costs against that, manage that, and then bring that uh, production to a close, but inherit all the metadata, archive all the assets. Um, and th this is a sort of common pattern that we're seeing with the studios, this ability to be able to relate productions, you know, instantiate environments for a production, build a production pipeline, and then be able to archive it. And in many cases, um, they don't need those assets to live beyond the production. And in fact, in some US, US cases, they, they want the legal entity to go away when the production's finished. So it just becomes, um, you know, it becomes more just part of their overall kind of production methodology. In other cases, though, they want to create an archive and reuse assets. So um, obviously, when, if you look at something like um, Marvel's Cinematic Universe, they actually want to have a lot of character and narrative interwoven between uh, those, uh, those films. And in fact, for them, not directly related to cloud, we're building, um, we've built a Marvel Cinematic Universe library in Media Central, and the editors can pull back uh, assets from any one of those pictures to cross-reference. So, so that was... Uh, Amazon Studios. I just wanted to touch on a couple of other things that we're working on that we think are kind of important to streamline some of the workflows. So uh, the long-awaited and uh, very late uh, integration between Media Composer and Pro Tools 
is something we've been working on for a while to be able to make it much easier to turn over projects. Again, if you think about what I was just talking about in terms of day and date releases and the type of scale that we're trying to support, you know, we, many users want the, the ability to be able to edit their Media Composer timeline and have it represented in, t in Pro Tools in real time, ideally. They really want the same timeline. That's going to take a while for us to get that all done. But we are starting to uh, release versions that, that have much more um, integration between those systems. The other area that we see as important is the ability to be able to, um, and this relates a lot more to some of the broadcast and the fast turnaround workflows, is if you like abstract the control of recording from the physical devices. So being able to record streams into the cloud from anywhere. So this uh, Media Central Acquire is a component, a module within Media Central that that's allows you to schedule resources and manage those in a, in a web browser. So you can be remote from where you're recording, and if you're recording into the cloud, you can be doing edit while capture style workflows. And then the last one I won't talk too much about, but uh, Nexus Edge, um, we're going to talk a bit more about uh, after the break. What's interesting with Nexus Edge, so a lot of what I've talked about is like cloud workflows where you're working where the assets are in the cloud. And then we just talked about acqu acquire where you're putting assets in the cloud and editing from the cloud. Nexus Edge is, uh, it sort of flips it around the other way and says if, the, if you've got assets in your facility on a Nexus, and then you want to have remote access to that uh, because you already own all that infrastructure, then Nexus Edge helps you to extend the reach of your facility uh, so that you can work more easily from home. And again, we, we will be talking a bit more about this in depth. But we see needing to offer these, um, really a range of solutions for clients that, and these fit different scenarios. You know, if you're if you need a short-term production on demand, then you'd use the cloud on demand systems. If you have a, an existing facility and you're just trying to optimize how that works for a hybrid use case where you've got people coming into the office a couple of days a week, but you already own the subscriptions, you already own the Nexus, then how do you work more hybrid? And that's really what this is trying to address. Okay. so. The other thing, uh, and in fact, it's great to see on Mark's slide so many of the sort of common partners. Um, one of the things that in my new role I'm responsible for is really rethinking some of the ways that we work with partners. Because if you think about the on-demand scenario that I took you through, we need to be able to partner with technology providers in the same way that you want to consume it. So if I rent to you an on-demand service for a week, you need the partner integrations to be rented for a week as well. So we're really working with partners to rebuild some of those models and integrate them into a program we call Works With On Demand. And that will be, you'll start to see more of that at NAB. Um, and it won't be all of these people, but uh, for some of the workflows where you need those integrations, again, we just want to make sure that we can instantiate the systems, automate their deployment, and then subscribe to them for you know, on-demand periods of time. Yeah, so just talking a little bit more about the sort of partner enablement and, in, and innovation. So um, if you're using some of our broadcast systems like Media Central and uh, um, some of those legacy systems, we've obviously had a lot of broadcast integrations over the years. I think one of the things that we can see in the, the context of the post-production workflows that we need is in Media Composer, we need to build an ecosystem of partners and integrations there. And certainly one area we're starting to look at more closely are the camera to cloud um, and l sort of lens to first edit scenarios where people want to compress the time from onset into editorial. Um, so these are th these are sort of previews of things we'll be talking a bit more about at NAB, but there's a lot of interest uh, in the partner community about being able to sort of tighten up those kind of integrations. Okay, so the last thing I just wanted to refer to, and this might be getting a little bit too nerdy, 
<laughs> so, um, so some of our clients um, want the ability to take the systems that we've built in on demand, but manage their own cloud infrastructure. Um, and sometimes those clients need to do that because of data sovereignty and control. There may be licensing or um, other restrictions that mean that they are not allowed to put that in a third party system, like they have certain agreements. So what we're actually going through the process of doing is taking a lot of the learning and the tooling that we've built for our on-demand systems where we can stand up environments in, an, let's say, 30 minutes, half an hour, um, sometimes even quicker. So stand up and configure those systems. But today they're in my tenancy, uh, in my Azure environment. So clients want to take that same methodology, take, take those same tools, but deploy it in their own tenancy. And we just need to be able to reconfigure some of the uh, namespaces, domains, like how we're controlling that and integrating it so it's configurable, but actually pop-up post-production can work in the same way. So uh, this is something we've started to, one, clients are asking for, two, we've already started to kind of work through what that means. And the idea here is that you would eventually be able to sort of pick a cloud you could run it in Azure, in your own Azure. I, you could run it, I can run it in my Azure. You can run it in your AWS environment, right? So that's um, something, again, we'll be talking more about um, in the sort of recent, well, in the near future. Um, and, we're, and we're seeing clients change, you know, they have a different level of experience around operating and managing these environments as well, which is interesting. Um, because actually running post-production in the cloud is quite different from some of the IT workloads that are very stable that, that many of the uh, teams that we work with in, in clients who've got cloud experience start to work with. All right, so I think with that, we may be having a coffee break. Thank you everyone for, for coming today. Thank you Digistore for having the Avid team. Um, my name is Chowie. I'm one of the solutions architects uh, for the Avid technology team here in APAC. Um, I know uh, Craig touched on a couple of uh, topics there in regards to edit on demand, um, but my plan today is just to give you a high level um, introduction into, into the platform, what it's capable of, and whether it would be a right fit on your platform. So what is Avid edit on demand? Avid on, edit on demand is uh, Avid's full SaaS cloud environment option. Um, it is living on the Microsoft Azure platform, and it is an extension to anything on-prem. So if you do have Nexus on-prem, um, Nexus Edge, and that it does complement uh, that environment, you are able to spin up, spin down, grow the environment as needed for production. There is no limit. You can push it um, within reason, obviously. And you don't need any cloud expertise to, to host a um, EOD system. Uh, the pricing is super simple. There is no additional cost if you uh, push it uh, to, it, to its limits during your production. If you decide that uh, you need some extra storage during, during the production, you can add, you can remove, you can add users and, and fix it to the production requirements as the system grows. So as an overview, um, there it's up to 30 concurrent edit clients but the ability to have 60 users running on the system at any, at any moment. The Nexus cloud system has been adopted to, to run in the cloud, so you have the ability to, to run from anywhere between one terabyte up to 200 terabytes of, of media storage. Like I said, it's just a matter of adding and subtracting some tokens as the production grows um, or decreases depending on, on the workflow. You use the ability of the file catalyst upload and download tool to quickly and securely get your media from on-prem, from the camera card, from the shoot, up into your cloud solution. And all of the download or egress um, functionality is included within the token and the, and the structured pricing. You do get that 24 by 7 um, Avid support. So that is a dedicated support team um, specialised in edit on demand that is available to you. And like I said before, no over overuse charges. So if you do, um, push the, the limit capability of, of what you've purchased and um, you're not going to be stung with a, an additional bill at the end of it. 
So just looking at uh, how it is all um, structured um, on the Microsoft Azure platform. As you can see, the, the workstation uh, broker, file transfer server, all included um, within the Microsoft Azure platform. The AvNexus cloud storage and media composer systems are all built for you. There is no installations, there's no management of the servers, it's all done um, for you on the, on the back end. What is provided from the customer side of things is obviously the remote client, um, editorial and ingest, supported across uh, laptops, editorial hardware that's already existing in, in systems and in premises, <coughs> uh, all the way down to, to zero clients that's capable of running any PCO over IP um, software. So it is relatively simple, uh, can run it off a laptop if need be, um, and it's really versatile, and like I said, you can adapt it to however your production um, requirements are needed. So we do live on eight regions of the Microsoft Azure platforms right across the world. This gives the users the ability to, um, like Craig was saying before, we had a, a customer shooting in New Zealand but editing in Los Angeles. That means you are able to spin up your edit on demand instance in the Americas and have the edit on demand system as close to the editorial team as possible, giving them the, the best performance. The users down on, on New Zealand obviously will still have the ability to use a file catalyst uploader tool to send that media to the edit um, on demand cloud platform and, and be able to shuffle that around. Coming down to where it is located, depending on whether the credits um, that you purchase. Obviously, if you're purchasing Australia Eastern credits, they're only used in Australian Eastern and vice versa for all the other regions. We have had some tests done in, in New Zealand, in Auckland, piggybacking off the Australia East uh, region, um, and they were very happy with performance. I'll touch on parameters in just a moment. So in terms of looking at the connectivity of um, the TC over IP, um, application into on demand, the latency to Azure, anything um, that is uh, up to 50 milliseconds is just like you're sitting on on-prem media composer, if not um, th the same. Anything 50 to 100 milliseconds is where majority of people start to, to fill in if you're on a, on a laptop, sitting in an airport, um, sitting on Wi-Fi. There is some lag and responsiveness that you do see, but it does fit and is perfectly capable for, for editorial. When you start pushing into the 100 to 250 milliseconds, you do start seeing performance degrade. Uh, and then of course, anything over 250 milliseconds is, is definitely not ideal and, and not supported. In terms of the download speeds from uh, your computer, anything low or idle activity, expecting that 0 0.5 to 2 megabit per second, and one thing to note there, that is per monitor. So if you do have multiple monitors, you obviously have to multiply that depending on, on how many you do use. I know a lot of people do have two, three, sometimes more monitors. Facing editing does fit inside the 10 to 20 megabits per second, per second range. And then obviously those that are doing the, the higher, the heavier work, the full screen playback, um, do the, the transfer of those, those pixels is up to 85 megabits per second. For a, for a general user, the suggested parameters there are the, the, that 60 milliseconds latency and 20 megabits per second per, per screen. So when you do set up a, an on-demand platform, you do have a number of options on what is available and what can be configured within that on-demand platform. I have two types of media composer seats. Uh, at the end of the day, it just comes down to the CPU um, usage. The advanced seats, um, using the 12 core that for the more heavier workloads, the onlining, uh, big rendering, um, and uh, transcoding workflows, and a lot of the, the admin tasks are more than capable on a, on a standard license, or a standard credit, I should say. If we have a look at the, the speed of the Nexus, uh, it's one thing I probably should note, we're looking at 400 to 600 megabytes per second per client. So we are looking at that SSD speed range. If you compare it to a one chassis, one media pack system on-prem, you're looking at, uh, at that as an entirety. 
So you are getting much faster speeds in, in the cloud than you would expect on an on-prem situation. If we then go down into the media composer software, this has just recently uh, changed in, in the later versions of it on demand, but we do support 2022.12.1 and 2021.12.7. They are not um, watered down versions of Media Composer. There's no difference in the capabilities of those Media Composers compared to on-prem or in the cloud. They are full-blown versions of Media Composer as you would expect on on-prem, where that comes down to bin locking, AMA imports, rendering, all that sort of stuff. So when you do purchase credits and set up an EOD system, what is included in, in, the, in the cost? So like I said, you do get an enterprise client of 2022.12.1 or 2021.12.7. Um, and inside that, because it's an obviously an enterprise client, you do get the script sync, phrase find, symphony, and news cutter or standard within that. Scalable cloud storage between one terabyte and 200 terabytes. If you do go and purchase a number of credits, does not mean you have to go and per use all those credits at the same time. Like Craig mentioned, as the, pr as the project grows and the demand for the storage or edit seats do change, you can either on a monthly or weekly uh, subscription uh, alter those, those settings accordingly. Like I said, you do still get cloud basic support. But then on the other side, we also uh, provide you with the HP Teradici Anywhere PC over IP uh, application for connectivity onto the EOD platform. And the file catalyst tool for your fast and secure upload and download direct to your Nexus from wherever uh, your production is. Few few notes for some updated features in the, in the last uh, year or so is the introduction and support of the Teradici PC over IP collaboration function within the PCRIP application. We'll touch on that in just a short moment. System and usage reporting uh, was introduced and is uh, quite an effective tool for, for administrators and systems admins to see of the, the platform that has been deployed, how much of it is actually being used, does it actually need to be shuffled back a little bit or do extra credits need to be added in or download reports um, for finance and for budgeting. Um, and then the continued support of the over-the-shoulder workflows, including the SRT playback workflow within, within Media Composer. It's exactly the same functionality uh, as on-prem workflows. And uh, Boris plugins within MC uh, are available as well. So if we look at how this then applies to um, a, a workflow example, Craig took my thunder and already touched on this, but just to uh, expand on this again. Um, out in the field shooting on um, any camera, bringing it in, creating a, a proxy on the second tier storage, uploading that proxy to, to the cloud for editorial, shipping all of those um, hard, the hard drives, shoot material to the end destination, and then it's a matter of using that file catalyst downloader to bring down the project and the final cuts to then conform back into to the, the final final product. One thing that is quite useful in that file catalyst application is those hot folder functions that uh, was introduced. A lot of people uh, have the ability then to set up a number of series of watch folders and bring in um, automatically uh, any camera cards out on the field um, without having then um, manual intervention to sort things and, and upload manually. So just touching on the over-the-shoulder workflow, uh, this is quite, um, quite useful on the on-prem situation. Obviously, you don't have your whole production team in your bedroom or in your office at home when you are uh, working. Sometimes there is a requirement for um, screeners, things like that. So it's a matter of using the SRT playback either to a Makita product or simply to VLC and changing the timeline settings uh, so you can provide a, a a real-time stream of whatever is pending on the outbound monitor of Media Composer. Um, it is quite simple whether you use um, direct over the internet or you use a, um, a streaming hub on premises. Really simple to use um, and it can be as simple as providing a QR code for the end user to scan, 
um, install uh, appropriate tools and see real time what is playing on your timeline. The other uh, additional tool is the PC over IP collaboration tool from within the, the Teradici application. Uh, this one is very similar to that SRT playback, but instead of it being the outbound tool, it is the entire um, screen layout. So the user, the guest user, does not need to be an avid EOD user. They don't need a credit. They don't need permissions into the system. It is a tool that then, um, within the edit on demand platform application, send a QR code. They can log in and see what is happening, audio included, um, on the actual screen. Does come quite in helpful uh, with tech support, um, or if there's a collaborative um, work environment that is required to see timeline specifics. That is also uh, a good use of the tool there. A little quick video. The world of editing is changing. Don't be bound by the office or limited to location. Edit where you want, when you want, with Avid Edit On Demand. It's a full virtual post-production environment in the cloud, built on the industry-leading media composer, Avid Nexus Storage, and state-of-the-art cloud infrastructure. Your full system is up and running within hours. Spin it up when you need it. Spin it down when you don't. Work efficiently at all times and let someone else worry about the maintenance and upgrades. Get your media into the cloud quickly and securely with the built-in file acceleration upload tools included in the package. Then, let your editors do what they do best, but do it from anywhere without bringing expensive workstations wherever they go. You can also expand your talent pool, taking on staff from outside your local area. Want an over-the-shoulder workflow of your producers and directors? Yep, that's all available too. Facility at full capacity? Take on new projects and get the extra seats you need in hours and get to work. Cloud-based editing and storage isn't the future, it is now. Get the benefits of Avid Edit On Demand. So like I touched on, it's, it's quite easy and relatively quick to, to spin up an EOD platform. You don't have the upfront cost of purchasing a Nexus, purchasing all the media composers, all the hardware. All it is is BYO um, edit front-end device. Um, and you can have an Edit On Demand platform running within, within the hour or two, depending on, on the region. Um, I have spun up um, and on demand platforms before and been working within an hour and a half. Uh, what happens as well is you do get a number of preset user profiles so they can go in and create all the workspaces you need. Media Composer is there ready to go. Um, the security is there so any new user, the first time they log in, they're required to change their password and then they're, they're ready to go straight away. Obviously, depending on the scale of your system, if you, when you add um, terabytes or add user accounts, there is um, a really quick spin up process that doesn't take too much time at all and that can all be done within the My Avid account. So unfortunately I don't have an Edit On Demand platform to show you, but uh, if you do, if you are interested in having a look at a demo, we can um, definitely reach out, you can reach out to the digital team or, or the Avid team and um, have a look at options and, and get that a feel of, of how Edit On Demand might work in, in your facility. But just looking at uh, how it quite easy it is to, to spin up, provided all the commercials are complete and you do have your registration code um, provided from Avid, it is just a matter of registering that software code within your um, media, your Avid portal. And then once it is in your My Products account, Your credits are, do appear in a, in a structured view, whether you have in multi-region uh, multiple different options of monthly or weekly subscriptions, multiple terabytes or even just a single terabyte, you do have a list here. It's just a matter of, it's just a matter of using those credits and allocating what, uh, how you'd like to structure it. I have uh, two systems here, so you can obviously add to it or create new ones. Click through. As you can see here, this system already has one standard seat of media composer and one uh, standard terabyte of storage on a weekly weekly term. Subscription start and end date 
and if I have available credits, that will appear here. So it would just be a matter of adding the quantity. You don't need to start as soon as you apply that credit. If you are preempting a, an influx of ingested material in a week's time, you can definitely change that start date so it's ready to go for, for, your, for that date. Once it is up and running, Avid will send you an email confirmation saying everything's ready. Um, log into your My Avid account to, to get going. And it will take you to the Avid On Demand portal where you can see all available instances of your Edit On Demand um, uh, installations. So what we do have here is a provided of the desktop uh, client installers where you can send that out to your editors and get them to install the latest and greatest PC over IP Teradici software. Um, and then they can already start with the, the host name there to, to make a connection. The file transport host is already there as well. And once those users are created within the Avid platform, uh, they'll then gain permissions into the appropriate uh, folder structure for the file ingest. When you do create users on the Edit On Demand platform, you only need to create them once and they will cascade through the, to the Nexus um, and through the system. You won't have to go to all the different layers to create those users. Um, everyone is given a uh, WS admin. WS admin account for workspace generation, um, logging into the Nexus administration tool. Um, for those that have seen it, it's just a, a smaller version of that create workspaces, uh, create uh, upper and lower limits, permissions, users, um, the works. Generating users in here is, is simply hitting new details in. Like I said earlier, you have up to 60 users on a cloud instance, only 30 concurrent users um, at any given time. When you use the Collaborate tool, that guest account does not um, include into that uh, 30 concurrent users. The system automatically generates a, a, a password for that user. Like I said as well, the, the user would be asked to change that password. It's not my password. Uh, change that password on first login. Uh, if it happens, people forget passwords, can go in here and reset passwords, um, delete users, change users. It also gives the functionality to be looking at different uh, all of your um, edit seats. So in this particular instance, this one has, has stopped. If there is issue, obviously redeploying, stopping and starting of, of that, uh, that instance. If we look at the usage of uh, the particular, v, uh, particular EOD instance, right now that this, this instance hasn't done anything, but um, downloadable report to see what's being used, how often it's being used, and be able to export that as a CSV to show and to, to use it for budgetary reasons to, to see where it needs to be expanded and um, decreased when needed. All right, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, so I'd like to talk to you all about uh, Avid Nexus Edge, which is a, a new workflow solution. Um, I, I guess it's intended as a, a means of leveraging your existing infrastructure um, and really extending the connectivity options to um, a distributed workforce out in the field. For over three decades, filmmakers, TV productions, and all kinds of content creators have used Avid tools and workflows to collaborate. The workflows were shaped by the tools themselves and by the intrinsic human need to collaborate, work together, and divide the effort amongst teammates. But then about 10 years ago, filmmakers and TV productions had a new ask. Was there a way for the workflow that they knew and were familiar with to extend beyond the boundaries of traditional brick and mortar post-production? Introducing Avid Nexus Edge. The need to collaborate and the need to work from anywhere isn't new, but the global pandemic made this need that much more dire and that much more urgent. To accomplish this, we start with our core competency in post-production. Shared storage in the form of a facility-based Avid Nexus, editing tools in the form of Avid Media Composer, and Avid shared bins, projects, and media. 
To enable a work from anywhere solution, we're adding a new proxy format. A proxy format is a sibling media format joined at the hip to every media file you have on your Nexus shared storage. Every clip in your Avid project will now have two media formats associated, a high resolution format and the new Nexus Edge proxy. The high resolution format is anything greater than the proxy. DNX 36 could be the high res, for example. Avid Nexus Edge is a new solution that ties together all the post-production focused tools from Avid. Avid Nexus shared storage, new versions of Media Composer and Media Composer distributed processing, and a new Nexus client, all of which are integrated directly into Nexus Edge. The objective is work from anywhere and to bring with you the workflows and tool sets that productions have relied on for decades. So Nexus Edge, uh, as I said, is intended to extend your Nexus file system, um, an existing investment or a, a new Nexus system that you might deploy on premise in a facility. Um, it uses this new proxy format um, uh, effectively to allow streaming and caching of the content to offsite editors, whether they're working from home or in other facilities. Um, very familiar workflow. It's the same workflow that editors are familiar with in the facility, but taking that outside of the walls. So it's intended to support a number of roles um, from your editors and assistant editors uh, through to producers, supervisors, those that need to do review and approval. Um, all of the, the common functions that would be required in a facility and would generally be through in-person collaboration um, can now be abstracted and that can be done remotely. So the four key elements, the intent is to be able to work from anywhere with anyone using the tools you're familiar with and you love and to simplify your workflow. Key features uh, within the proxy workflow is obviously to you know, create playback and edit with those proxies. Uh, the same sh bin sharing and locking is available for all users. Um, the, the browse and search functionality, we add phonetic search and take that away from the editor application. So that's available as part of the Nexus Edge platform rather than individual editors. Um, there is the ability to uh, copy the media and bring that to your local machine, disconnect from the system and continue your edit. Uh, and you can fast switch between the high res and the proxy media. So the new proxy that we've touched on, um, this is, is really the, the key to enabling um, the, the remote workflow and the caching of the content, uh, whether you're streaming that or whether you're localizing that to the remote client. The new client manager enables the remote Nexus option for those working outside of the facility. There's that remote access to bins and projects, the same bins and projects that are being worked on in the facility. Distributed processing is, has been enabled to allow simple transcode of ingested content to the proxy format. The web client connector enables uh, a connect connection into the system in Google Chrome so that you can have uh, certain roles who might not need a full-scale media composer, they can interact with the bins and the projects and the media in a lightweight browser application. Editing connector, so natively supporting Media Compo Composer Enterprise. There's also an option to add uh, an Adobe connector and Premiere Pro seats where we can do some um, project templating and management as well. The air-gapped workflow, localizing that content, being able to disconnect work on what you need to and check your, your changes back into the system when you reconnect. And all of this is enabled by a, a single server which overlays over the top of your Nexus and runs the orchestration and authentication. So that new proxy workflow, um, 
this from a user perspective is incredibly simple. Um, we'll touch on you know, how it works in the back end shortly. Um, from a user perspective, you can basically choose to uh, transcode via distributed processing, select your clips, select a bin, one click action, and start creating proxies. Um, those proxies are intrinsically linked to the high res, and that enables the fast switching. So the, um, the edge file surf server um, maintains those links between the proxy and the high res for you. You don't have to think about it. And uh, yeah, no relinking needed whatsoever with that automated link. So the proxy format, it's a uh, high quality H.264, um, three meg for the video track, for every four audio tracks, that's about another meg and that can scale as needed. Um, so pretty lightweight. Um, and this is where I guess there's a, it's a differentiator between that PC over IP technology and a remote Nexus client. Um, low bandwidth consumption, you don't need to have uh, you know, a high speed NBN internet connection, you can be on a lower speed connection. Um, helps smooth out some of those connectivity issues. The Nexus Client Manager, the same client manager that you'd be running in the facility, just with the ability to enable that remote Nexus client. Um, so you would conceivably connect to your VPN, launch your client manager with the remote checkbox enabled. You'd be able to see the Nexus, let's say from home, uh, you'd be able to see that Nexus in the facility and mount the workspaces in the same way that you would in the facility. So the bin locking functionality, obviously something that's very important to collaboration and uh, post-production workflows. <laughs> Don't want people treading on each other's toes. Um, that, that is exclusive to obviously Media Composer, but now also to Nexus Edge. Uh, you can collaborate from anywhere on Composer with those shared projects. Um, the, there's, there's really no change management process from a user perspective. The users that have been working in the facility are already familiar with the tools. They know how to use the Nexus client. They know how to use Media Composer. It's very simple transition to get them working remotely. And um, for internet connections that may not be particularly good uh, or are less stable, um, you've got that option to copy the media locally. So underpinning the proxy format that drives all of this is distributed processing. Distributed processing is effectively orchestration of transcode, render, export jobs uh, to a farm of media composers. Um, those media composers can be the existing media composers in the facility. It has the smarts to know when media composers are idle or when, when they're in use. Um, so you can quite easily trigger a job and know that an editor working on a production won't be impacted their system won't be used, but the empty edit suite down the hall would be used for the transcode job. Um, you can set up uh, groups within this that are specific to different types of functions, whether that's transcode, render, export. Um, and it, it significantly accelerates those tasks. It's not single threaded on a single machine. It's farming out the job. You know, you're basically multiplexing the job and getting it done quickly. The web client connector. Uh, so this is you know, Google Chrome. You log into the Nexus Edge system. Um, for those that are familiar with Media Central, similar kind of look and feel, um, but this is specific to Nexus Edge as far as interacting with the projects and the bins directly on the Nexus. Um, so it's a, a very simple overlay to the existing workflow. And just presenting. Um, some of, some of these functions and the ability to manipulate and set up projects uh, in a different way, a more lightweight way. So you don't necessarily have to have a huge pool of Media Composer licenses if you've got assistant editors who are purely responsible for managing the media and doing those uh, more sort of administrative tasks. Um, markers and locators, so this is great for producers as well to be able to preview. Um, they can preview the rushes, they can add markers, put in comments, um, and those assistants can create and organize the, uh, the projects, as I said. So across different projects, 
you can manage readily. That there's no real limitation as far as you know working single threaded in a in a specific project. Um, you can even do rough cuts or shot listing in here. So if you've got a producer that thinks they know what shot they want to use, um, they can do the the shot list and and commit that to the project so that uh, the the offline or online editor can come in and, and take that and work with it. Rebu review and approval workflows for producers are pretty handy in here as well. Um, so for those producers that might need to screen something, they can do that from within a browser, just VPN into the facility. Um, they can review, they can add comments to suggest that it's approved and move forward in the workflow. The editing connector, so Media Composer Enterprise is what really enables Nexus Edge. If you've got Media Compo Composer Enterprise, you've already got the license you need to be able to deploy Nexus Edge. Um, the connector for Premiere Pro is uh, an additional cost, uh, and the web connector is also additional cost. But if you've got Media Composer Enterprise, you've already got what you need. So this air-gapped workflow, um, the option to be able to copy the media, um, you can choose low res, high res, you can bring the bins with you, all of that's encrypted on your local drive. So from a security perspective, it's not like you can have an editor that will take the content away and do something they shouldn't be doing with it. Um, they can really only perform the edit and when they connect back in, they can commit the changes they've made within the ADLs, the bins, back into the Nexus. Um, you can switch readily to a single click to switch between proxy and high res, um, whether that's air gapped or whether you're connected to the system. Assuming you've got the bandwidth, if you're connected remotely, you can work in high res as well. Uh, and the proxy media you can create from camera cards as well. So you can have people who you're collaborating with in a different location start work on that proxy content that you've created from your remote system. So within the file server software, uh, the bin manager service, which effectively enables that bin locking, whether that's from the browser or from the remotely, remotely connected clients, the distributed processing service, which is the orchestration for that proxy creation and transcode workflow, Media Composer Enterprise licensing is hosted here as well, the proxy resolver service, uh, phonetic indexing if you're doing uh, phonetic search, and uh, for the web client, there is an on-the-fly stream of proxy content created to serve out to the browser. So how does this look as far as a topology is concerned? You've got your on-prem systems. This could all be existing with the exception of the edge server. You overlay that edge server on top of your nexus. You've got the proxy created from the high-res with distributed processing through a firewall, generally, you know, VPN into the facility. You've got the remote Media Composer Enterprise and the Nexus Client Manager, remote checkbox enabled. They connect and perform their functions as if they were in the building. The web client running on Chrome, it's the same scenario, VPN in, you've got a URL that you put in Chrome, you log in with your credentials and you can start manipulating those projects and bins. So really the purpose of this is to take that existing infrastructure that you've already invested your money in, um, you've got workflows that work for you in post-production, some of the best workflows in post-production. This is really a way to elevate that and extend that and put those workflows into the hands of that distributed workforce. Whether it is you know, another facility that you've got within your organisation, whether it is people wanting to work from home, that's, uh, it's really just enabling that extension of workflow. Um, thanks so much everyone for coming along today. That was great. We've actually wound up a little bit earlier, so um, 10 minutes before time, but I really encourage you to um, hang around. We've got um, drinks and nibbles, um, so please um, stay and enjoy that. Um, catch up with the team here. Um, ask any more hard questions that you didn't want to ask in public and thought you might ask them once you get them on their own. They'll be around for a little while. So um, 
Thanks very much for your attention. We look forward to talking to you in the future.